Good day to you. The other day I was talking to a graduate student in a doctoral program, and she was telling me she was having a hard time finishing her dissertation, and she was trying to pick a dissertation topic that was of interest to her advisor. And I thought that was so strange. I thought, why would you choose a dis dissertation topic that's important to anybody other than yourself first? It seemed like she was trying to satisfy that requirement so that she could get through the program. Now, I may be wrong about that, and I'm not trying to, to, dis to cast aspersions towards her academic integrity, but it does identify, does it not, a philosophy for how to be as a student. It's a philosophy of practicality in this particular case, if it's the case that she just wants to get her degree. Whereas there is another philosophy that could be at play, which is I want to learn about something that I'm most interested in. Or yet another philosophy that I want to pursue a dissertation because I want to dedicate it to solving a problem that exists in the world. Those are different ways of looking at pursuing a degree. They are different philosophies. And it's the way that I'm introducing class today because we are taking on the subject of philosophies of media systems in the countries that we're studying in this course and in, in fact across the world. And the reading for day is, is a hefty one because it's such a theoretical subject. There really was no comparison in my book between countries, so I didn't have to extract any of that. We're re basically reading the whole chapter from my book today, and it's going to be covering different philosophies for media systems. Philosophies have to do with, with setting up a media system to achieve a particular purpose. That's right, media systems don't just grow up in countries, they are guided. We have already sort of gotten across that idea that they are guided by culture, right? That's what we talked about last time, cultural characteristics. Now, when we were studying cultural characteristics, we weren't gonna have a big idea of how those cultural characteristics are gonna play out in terms of each student's individual country's media system in this class, Italy, Australia, whatever it is that you're studying, because culture is so broad and we're just getting into it. We're just looking at really the very underground of media systems. Now we're proceeding in a similar path, but we're getting more narrow. We're starting to look at how cultural characteristics also give rise to philosophies that nations and countries and regions of the world, they tend to have outlooks towards the purpose of their media systems. And the purpose for media systems is not the same across all countries as, as we will shortly find out. So we're going to take on those we're going to take on those philosophies today, and we're going to we're going to start with the one that is the oldest philosophy. And by today's standards, it's really easy to say, you know, this philosophy is just so out of date. How do you, how could anybody have ever liked it? It's obvious the flaws in this philosophy, but. Remember, this is a philosophy that is coming about in the 1500s, and you can even trace it back to Plato in ancient Greece. This is the authoritarian philosophy. You know, it's the philosophy authoritarianism that's at play with you and your parents, right? When you and your parents are, are going at it when you're a teenager, and they're making you come home on time, and they're trying to get you to eat things by offering incentives because they know those things are good for you, and, and they're not letting you hang out with certain friends, they are deciding because they have the wisdom that comes with age and experience and they have your best interests in mind and they are the ones who support you and that they get to decide certain things about your life and that's authoritarianism but it's it's in the form of government or in the form of a ruler usually a ruler there's a ruler behind most authoritarianism somebody who has a kind of supreme status in society often with a connection, a perceived connection, to a deity. Yeah, often the ruler of a country where authoritarianism has a play, is at play claims that they are, the, you got to go through them to get to the deity. We saw this kind of authoritarianism rise up very strongly in, in uh, Italy and Germany under Nazism, but we can still see it today. And listen, when we talk about philosophies, all of them, all six of them, we're not talking about them as, as each country has just one philosophy and that one philosophy describes it. We're not like that. We're talking about mixtures of these philosophies guiding countries. So, so actually, you can say that every country in the world will have at least little doses of all of these philosophies. For example, authoritarianism exists in the United States. After 9-11, after 9-11, the United States passed the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act, among other things, gives the government the right to survey every phone call that you make to a person in a foreign country. Every, every time you call somebody, even in Canada, 
your phone call could be recorded by the national i think it's the national security national security nca national security don't quote me on the agency but yeah the Patriot Act. That's an authoritarian measurement. It speaks to authoritarianism. Now, one of the distinguished fe distinguishing features of authoritarianism is that the media ownership is actually private. You would think it would be government-owned, but it's not. It's privately owned, but the media are expected to serve the ruler, to be obedient, just like kids are expected to be obedient to parents. And if they are not, it's pretty simple. <laughs> you lose your life. You're put in jail. You're not licensed again. You go missing. That's authoritarianism. It's very, very strict. The ruler has the best interests of the population in mind and has the unique ability to connect with the deity. Those are the keys for how authoritarianism often plays out. So you can read some more about that. Uh, my purpose today is not to go over all of the details in the chapter, but to try and really set up the big ideas. So let's go on to the next philosophy. Now, the philosophy I'll have to say that is most closely identified with the United States, libertarianism. Libertarianism actually grew up as a reaction. It grew up as a reaction to authoritarianism, and it swung the other way. It said, you know, let, let's let's have a, a system, a philo philosophical system that tries to say that people are, should be free from government, that government should be completely out of their lives, and that as long as people have an ability to, to have that freedom, they will make decisions that will drive the, the particular society's decision-making in good directions. Now, this also means that profit-making is allowed within the libertarian system. Profit-making is allowed because people should have the freedom to make money and to allow the marketplace to determine what the supply is going to be of certain products. And nowhere is that more evident than in the United States media system where if I were to ask you, do we have quality TV shows on on in the evening? You know, it's a very subjective question, but how would you really answer that? You might say if you were, were criti critically analyzing it in one particular direction, you might say, you know, we have very popular shows. We have very popular shows, but quality shows? Hmm, quality shows that really cause you to think, cause you to, to be challenged, maybe shake up some of your beliefs, maybe present ideas that you never would have thought of before, maybe do some things that are outrageous, necessarily outrageous, to get you to, to, to grow your mind. Hmm, that's more on Netflix, isn't it? That's more streaming, but TV itself doesn't have a lot of quality. And yet TV has millions and millions and millions of viewers. And so, so the marketplace, that is that, that people are willing to buy the stuff, but the stuff is not necessarily that great. The TV shows are not necessarily that fulfilling, maybe entertaining, not necessarily fulfilling. That is a function of a marketplace and profit making. So libertarianism and profit making very much go together. That's why they fit so well in our country and one of the other countries being studied in this class, and, and that is Japan. You'll find the same thing going on there. Libertarian media philosophy is very much at play in the United States. Let's go on to a third media philosophy, one that we sort of automatically dismiss as evil, and that is the communist media philosophy. Oh yeah, communists. Who? But wait a minute. How many communists do you know? Go ahead, count them up. Hold your hand up and count, up, how, count up how many communists you know. Or, or even better, how many communists have you had a conversation with? Are you coming up with this? I wouldn't be surprised if you are, because that's how much we screen out communism in the United States. Now, I'm not saying that I have a lot of experience with communists, but I've talked to quite a few. There's quite a few in Europe that I've talked to, and, and I've been to China. And I can tell you that I have a completely different understanding of communism. I've got to tell the story of when I was in Beijing. Uh, was it Beijing? Yeah, it was Beijing. No, it was Shanghai. Sorry. A Shanghai, a city that is so incredibly large. It looks like one of these these cartoon movies with Batman or, or Spider-Man. Even better, Spider-Man, where Spider-Man's going through the city swinging from skyscraper to skyscraper on his lines. And that's what Beijing looks like. We traveled for 45 minutes by car on a very fast highway. And all I saw was high-rise buildings way higher than New York City. And the top of each building, by the way, once it got dark, was illuminated with beautiful light. It's like the whole city was a Christmas tree at night. But I just couldn't believe the scope of this city. So at any rate, just a little diversion there, a little story from travels. 
But one night I was sitting in the dormitory. One day I was sitting in the dormitory and I heard this, what sounded to me like, he, ha, hoo, ha. Some of you have heard this story before. He, ha, ho, ha. And I was like, what is that? So I thought, I better go check this out. I went outside and there were speakers, audio speakers planted in the ground every few feet. So the same voice was playing out of all of these speakers. So I thought I, I came to the conclusion it was obvious. Obvious that this was Chinese propaganda and that this was a government march kind of uh, kind of a chant that was going on to, to keep people on the ready for military action. And I was certain of it. And then I went back to the dorm and talked to the residence hall and found out that that actually that was the exercise lady. Yeah, the exercise lady. Yeah, the communist government believes that it's important for its population to have it drilled into them, if you want to say it that way, the values of exercise. So that lady was actually doing chants for people to do sit-ups by. Completely different from what I thought of and also speaking to communism and how it can be misperceived. Yes, is that a very strong-arm idea to have propaganda, which they use, by the way, willingly. They even have a department of propaganda. It's not a negative term in China. It's just a factual term. Propaganda, Government propaganda is to get people to exercise. Yeah, it's propaganda, but is it bad for society? And that's kind of a feature of communism that you'll find out, especially when it applies to media. The media systems within a communist philosophy are, are must. They must. They must try to elevate the tastes of the public. That's why you have a lot of opera. That's why you have a lot of dance. That's why you have a lot of high arts because the tastes of the public must not be left to just degenerate into mass mass consumption and eating, but to be elevated so that people have fulfilling lives and can contribute to future generations with, with excellent artwork or other contributions to society. So that's the idealistic side of communism, but of course it's got a really, really dark and, and heavy-handed side. All media are owned under a communist system. I didn't say anything about the libertarian system, but I would hope you would assume that media are private property in a libertarian system. In communists, the government owns the media, government censors the media. When I was there, I couldn't get on Facebook. Facebook, blank page, web page not available. It's blocked, yeah. They don't allow a lot of outside influences coming in. But then again, do we? Or would we have at least one or two people who are communists who you would have spoken to at some point in your 18 years, sorry, in your 25, 26, 27 years, as a graduate course, however old you are, of life, would you have met a communist if we had an open system? That's a, a seed I'm planting in you right now. All right, let's go on to the philosophy system that is also um, is also associated with the United States because it was born here, but it actually was put into practice and still is in practice much more in Europe. And that's called social responsibility. And that philosophical system grew up out of a professor, Professor Hutchins, in the University of Chicago. And the time period was right after World War II. Uh, World War II and the aftermath left a lot of cynicism in American in American media, you had media reporting on wars in sensational ways and, and really trying to scare the public into feeling that this, this giant World War III clash between the United States and the Soviet Union was imminent through nuclear warfare. At the same time, you had had the, the after effects of World War II media where you'd go in to see a, a film in a theater and, and the trailer beforehand was kill a Jap today. Kill a Jap, today. not a Japanese even, but a Jap today because we were at war with them in World War II and that was it was our government propaganda, right? So so Professor Hutchins thought this is a terrible way for media to be leading um, nationwide conversations. We need to have a better sense of, of responsibility. And so that's what he did with his commission and he put together a new philosophy called social media responsibility. And it's all about the media have a privileged position in society. Not so much today as they used to have, a uh, privileged position being that they have so much power, they have immediate access to millions and millions and millions of people. You know, like an NBC, CBS, or ABC, one of those three networks, if you were to have watched them in um, in the 1970s, for example, all, if you take all three of them together, they would have had probably 90% of the television audience, three networks. That's how powerful they are. That's They have that privileged position, right? Today, I say not so much, right? Because... How all the other technologies that distribute media content, the, the, mainly through the phone, the laptop too, and some days we'll have little scrolls that we can open up and suddenly we have a big screen TV that we brought with us as a poster, probably a collapsible poster that we can put in somebody's house and play video games on. That's probably what's coming. 
but we're not there yet. At any rate, we're talking about media in under social responsibility, the primarily television, radio, newspapers creating that cynicism and Professor Hutchins wanting to say, no, we, we should be conducting ourselves better. We should be more responsible. We should be covering both sides to an issue. We should be providing a wealth of information about a subject, not just short sound bites and headlines, etc. So Professor Hutchins developed a kind of code of ethics, if you would like to think. And, and what's unique about the social responsibility system, I believe, is that it's inviting media properties, media owners, media distributors to themselves take on the responsibility. It's not relying on government to say, no, 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 you you don't do that, but you're gonna you're gonna be you know beheaded or in trouble in some other kind of way. It's not up to people completely on their own. It's more like in a social responsibility system, the government is a referee. The government is a referee. The government is saying we're going to stand on the sidelines until there is unfair play. Then we're throwing the yellow flag and unnecessary. There's well, yellow flag would be a penalty, but we're going to stand on the sidelines until there is uh, a flag that is needed. Okay, so the next philosophy that I would like to go on to is uh, a philosophy that is sort of new. It's a new philosophy in the sense that it doesn't have the age-old testing and writing and and development and 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 um, research at the university level, it, but it's getting there. It's a philosophy that's called developmental philosophy, and it refers to those countries that are developing developmental philosophy. And by the way, if you're a person who uses the phrase third world country, I'd like you to know it's out of date. I'd like you to know it's offensive. I'd like you to know it's condescending because it comes from the first world being during World War II and that whole stalemate time period that gave rise to social media and uh, gave rise to social responsibility theory and embodied that cynical time period, World War II. During that time period, there was the first world. That was the really industrialized Western world. That was going to be the Canada, the United States, Britain. Yeah, and then there was the second world. The second world was the Soviet world, you know, with Russia in the middle, also Czechoslovakia and Poland, those countries that Russia had control over that they, they then eventually um, withdrew from. And then you had the third world. The third world were those tiny countries that were so tiny and powerless that they could not afford to align with the first world or the second world countries so that they had to remain independent and just try and eke along, you know, an Ecuador, for example, a Costa Rica, for example, you know, a Congo, Africa, for example, those are third world countries. They all, all also happen to be very, very poor and, and lacking development of media infrastructure. So we don't refer to those countries in that way anymore. We refer to them as developing. They're in need of developing. That's what the developmental philosophy is all about. It says that government and media should really have a relationship. There should be a, a relationship of mutual support in a way that the government needs the media and the media need the government. Yeah, the government needs the media because the government needs the media to get the word out about new highways, about health programs, about educational opportunities, and, and yes, about things that are going wrong, but hopefully that's not what's all that's emphasized. Whereas the media need the government because they need access to the information. The media need access to funding and resources to build themselves up. You don't just start a TV station overnight. It takes an incredible amount of investment and all that equipment and electricity and, and then all the training for the professionalism that is involved in the staff, the anchors, the technical directors, the people who, who produce shows. Yeah, television is very, very expensive and you got to have electricity. A lot of countries don't. There are still big, big areas of Ghana, Africa where there's no electricity. And so they're right away, no TV, right? And those areas also sometimes only have oral languages, no written languages, so no newspaper. <laughs> so what's the most important mass medium in parts of Ghana and other parts of Africa? Radio, yeah. So at any rate, back to developmental philosophy and radio, is knowing that, that what I just mentioned is a key to that, is knowing how are you going to be able to disperse information from the government in the most effective way to the population so that you try to eradicate illiteracy, public health crises, corruption, and, and conflict within your country. If you have, you know, we had a civil war in our country. There's still plenty of countries that are having those that same kind of problem. So developmental is all about media, not just bagging, not just bagging 
on the government, but trying to help the government. Not, of course, it's not saying they're in bed with each other. The media are still there to be a watchdog and to try and catch the government in corruption. It's been part of the problem of the third world countries in the past that they have had, they have had despots. They've had authoritarian leaders who have, you know, been susceptible to corruption and, and uh, piled in, piled up huge amounts of wealth. And finally, we go to the last, it seems like I forgot one. Did I figure out what to do? Let's see, one, two, three, four. I got libertarian, I got authoritarian. What was next? Uh, communist I did, social, yeah, I think I got five. Okay, so we got the last one. Now, the last one also similar to developmental philosophy. The last one is also pretty new, and it sort of began in the United States and in many ways still is being driven in what's going on in the United States. It's called the democratic participant philosophy, the democratic participant philosophy. And what this says is, you know, throughout the course of the history of media in almost every country, media have been owned by the rich and the powerful, the people who have the wealth. You know, Rupert Murdoch, he owns the Fox News Network. He came to the United States with millions of dollars already earned from his media empire in Australia. Now, what if you had the same chance to start up a, a brand new television network and build it up to what Fox is within 30 years with your present status in our society? I guess it's possible. Is it likely? No. So democratic participant theory is all about, let's try and put media production and media distribution in the hands of the average citizen. That's what a democracy relies on. It relies on participation. Democratic participant philosophy is speaking to that. Each and every person has a role in creating media content. Because otherwise you can't say, hey, I've got a great idea for a TV show. I'm going to go to NBC and I'm going to ask them. You can't go to the Pocono Record and say, I'd like to write an article for you. You can write a letter to the, to the editor, but it's going to be yay big, right? You can't go to a radio station and say, I want to play some of my tunes. You can't do that, right? So, but what you can do is you can go on YouTube. You can post a Facebook video. You can post a photograph on Instagram. You can send a, a mass email. You can create a web page. You can do any number of things today that don't require a whole team of people. I know so many students who are musical artists and they're doing their whole song on their iPhone. They're doing keyboards. They're doing brass. They're singing drums. Drums is an easy one, right? So many drum beats. Yeah, that's the kind of world that you live in. It's all ripe for democratic participant theory and creating your own media content. And actually, I'm certain that many people in this class have already created media content. And isn't that kind of what you're doing when you're video gaming online, although you're still playing within the structured rules of the game? You're, you're dispersing content individually. That's what democratic participant theory is all about. And it's the idea that we're taking away control of the media content from those big, rich, powerful corporations who who, as we established under the section of global media conglomerates and globalization, they have really only one interest in mind, and that is to make profit. So everything else is uh, secondary. Yeah, and that's the theme that we're going to be exploring um, throughout this class. So before we leave, I just want to mention to you that most countries, including yours today, should be analyzed using two perspectives. That's the best way you can analyze it. There are pieces of all of these philosophies. Sorry, two philosophies, I mean. There are pieces of all of these philosophies in every country, as we mentioned, but if you tend to look at two of them together, you can really get at the, the majority of how the country operates. So have fun investigating that today. Make it like Sherlock Holmes behind me on the wall here. Yeah, that painting was done by my uh, uh, colleague of mine at ESU, actually. I want to give him credit. His name is Herb Weigand. He's a professor in the art department. He made that for me many years ago. So have, a, have fun with that today. I wish you the best.